I've done around 70 episodes about St. John Bosco's life on this channel, and I can tell you that today's story, without a shadow of a doubt, is my absolute favorite, because it talks about his loving kindness towards the Oratory Boys, a virtue that can only be born from charity. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. While Don Bosco attended to the religious and moral well-being of more than 700 young people who were part of the festive oratory of St. Francis de Sales, he also watched over the thousand young people who attended oratories of St. Louis Gonzaga and the Guardian Angel, never forgetting about the poor youngsters of his growing hospice. Indeed, he regarded them as the apple of his eye, and he cared for them as much as the most solicitous and affectionate fathers would have. One year, his pupils numbered about 40. Parish priests, relatives, and others wrote to him almost continuously to recommend some child to be put in his care. Don Bosco listened to so many miseries, and he felt greatly moved by them. Fearing that a given boy would come to a bad end if he refused to receive him, he often took the child in. He couldn't resist, especially the appeals made by the youngsters themselves. In 1884, the school inspector of La Spezia, Signore Bonino Alvaro, told us the following incredible account of something he witnessed when he attended the oratory as a catechist, being a municipal elementary teacher in 1850. A father had become a Protestant in Turin to receive 30 denarii which the enemies of God paid for apostasies. The wretch demanded that his wife and son likewise convert to Protestantism. Still, the good woman was firm in religion and held her son back also. They were Savoyards from an area in northwestern Italy ruled by the Savoy dynasty. Because of her husband's wretched apostasy, the poor mother wept and prayed. One night, her son had a dream. He felt that he was being dragged to the temple of the Protestants and struggled in vain to resist. While he was struggling in the dream, a priest appeared freed him and led him away. He awoke in the morning and described the dream to his mother. She sought every chance to shelter her son in some institution, for his father would not abandon his wicked divisiveness. She came across a person who advised her to visit Don Bosco in Valdoco to see if she could find refuge for her son in the oratory. She went there with her boy on a Sunday morning. They entered church when she learned it was time for mass and Don Bosco proceeded to celebrate. Signore Bonino Alvaro knelt beside the little boy. Then, as soon as the boy saw Don Bosco, he cried out, Mama, Mama, it's him! It's him! It's really him! That's the priest who appeared in my dream! The little boy screamed and his mother cried. After reminding the family that the church was no place to scream like that, Signore Bonino saw that he could not quiet the little boy. So he led the mother and son to the sacristy, where he heard the account of the dream and how the son recognized the liberating priest in Don Bosco. When our saint returned to the sacristy after having finished celebrating the sacrifice of the mass, and before he could remove his vestments, the boy ran to clasp his knees, pleading, My father, save me! Don Bosco accepted the boy into the oratory, and the young man stayed there for many years. Most people know that St. John Bosco had supernatural visions from above, but what about his oratory boys? What if I were to tell you that a young man named Zuka received apparitions from Our Lady? That's the story that I'm going to tell you today. Don Bosco's zeal in promoting the glory of God no doubt pleased the Queen of Angels very much. As we have already heard in other episodes, she gave him continual help in developing his institution and in directing and sanctifying his dear pupils. He obtained countless graces from our Lord that he lavished on the faithful who requested his prayers and blessings, as we will hear in other episodes. For now, we'll focus on marvelous events described by authoritative witnesses. On the eve of the Nativity of Most Holy Mary, September 7, 1857, a young student named Zuka was sick in bed with a fever. Suddenly, the Blessed Virgin appeared at his side, looking unspeakably loving and majestic. She said to him, I have come because I love this house very much. 
I'll tell you what I desire from the boys, and you will report my message privately to each of your companions. After she gave the sick young man some information, she slowly proceeded through the room. At each empty bed, she gave Zuka a message to the boy it belonged to. When she reached the bed of young Gastaldi, she said to Zuka, warn this boy in my name that he should go immediately to confession, for he has not approached the sacraments since Easter. Returning to Zuka's bed, she added, you will give this message to Don Bosco and your teacher. Then she disappeared. Only this privileged young man could bear witness to the first part of this account, but what happened next was witnessed by the entire community of about 200 people. From the moment of her visit, Zuko was perfectly healed, but it was already late evening, so he didn't rise from his bed. Instead, he sent for his dormitory comrades, who were enjoying recreation, to tell them he had an important message to communicate. His friends went up immediately and surrounded his bed, standing somewhat apart from one another. He asked each one to approach him and confided what the Blessed Virgin had said concerning them in secret. He possessed a demeanor of gravity and conveyed an air of authority in contrast to his youthful face. The young men silently stood in his presence, stunned and reverent. As he finished, he exclaimed, I need to talk to Gastaldi but Castaldi had not come. A companion ran to call him and led him to Zuka's bed. Zuka passed along the message that Our Lady had entrusted to him regarding Gastaldi's need to go to confession. At that hour, Don Bosco heard confessions in the sacristy. Hearing what Our Lady had said, Gastaldi answered, all right, I'll go at once. And he left the dormitory to go to confession. But as he went downstairs, he changed his mind thinking, these are all just stories. But not wishing to ignore his friend's advice, he entered the sacristy and passed into the chapel of Our Lady. He spent some time on his knees to devise the lie he wanted to tell Zuka, after which he returned to the dormitory. None of the other young men had seen where Gastaldi went. He was about to say, now I am joyful, when Zuka's face took on an expression like that of a prophet. Zuka sat up on the bed and said to Gastaldi in the presence of all, you're an imposter. Can you imagine that I didn't see you? You didn't go to confession. He then described the route Gastaldi had followed and how he had stopped at the altar of Our Lady. Zuka commanded him to return and see that you do not abuse God's mercy. Go at once. Confused by the evidence set before him, Gastaldi dared no longer to ignore the rebuke. Promising that he would go to confession, he left. Zuka spoke as if he saw exactly what was happening, fixing his gaze on the door. He said to the others present, he's now descending the stairs. He's now under the porches. He enters the sacristy and kneels. He approaches Don Bosco now. Now he's confessing. After a while, Gastaldi returned all cheerful. He had neither the need nor the chance to report what had happened because Zuka told him at once, now you can say you're happy, but see that you continue to be good because Our Lady told me you must change your life, otherwise you'll be punished. To everyone's amazement, the next morning Zuka was out of bed. At playtime during the day, he called aside his companions one by one and with an inspiring demeanor, he gave them Our Lady's message. When he was through, each boy remained pensive. No one dared to laugh. Finally, Zuka approached one of his teachers, a young cleric greatly respected and feared by his pupils, none of whom would ever have dared to make the least critique of him. This cleric was unaware of what had happened with Zuka, but when Zuka unexpectedly came up to him and with an air of authority spoke to him in Our Lady's name, he felt such reverence that he couldn't speak as though he were in the presence of his superior. Zuka's message was so personal that it left no room for doubt about its heavenly origins. In 1989, a friend of mine went to Rome and took a tour of a Catholic school run by the Sisters of St. Dorothy. There was an incorrupt body of the foundress, St. Paula Frasinetti, who was under an altar of the school church in a glass case. Someone asked, would you like to see her room? And they took my friend upstairs, indicated St. Paula's humble quarters and said, 
This is the room that she used to talk to St. John Bosco in, though he lived miles away from Rome in Turin. The guide said that St. John Bosco would supernaturally appear to St. Paula and give her advice on how to run her school for girls. In today's episode, we'll discuss the Sisters of St. Dorothy and their spiritual connection with St. John Bosco, including a miraculous cure through his intercession. St. Paula Frasinetti, who lived from 1809 to 1882, contemporary with Don Bosco, was foundress of the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Dorothy. She opened boarding schools and orphanages for the poor and needy youth in Liguria and Rome. Eventually, she established a presence in many other parts of Italy and the world, such as Malta, Portugal, Brazil, and the United Kingdom. When Don Bosco came to St. Onofrio to visit St. Paula, he told the sisters, your mother general is like a sunflower. He was referring to the fact that St. Paula's mind and heart was always turned toward God. While in Rome in the year of our Lord, 1882, Don Bosco became the means of the Lord's comfort for Mother Paola Frasinetti. She had known him for several years and admiringly sought to imitate him as best she could in her personal daily life. Learning that she was ill, Don Bosco stopped in to see her. All the sisters were thrilled by his visit, for they hoped that through his presence and blessing, their reverend mother would be restored to health. I don't think that Paula had any thought of recovering, but she took heart in knowing that the Lord God was comforting her in her advanced age through this great apostle of charity. She was moved with holy joy at seeing him and recommended herself to his prayers. His Christian love and kindliness and warm friendliness for their mother cheered the sisters, though it didn't fully meet their expectations. They were hoping for a miracle, a divine favor, or at least a prophetic utterance to assure them of her recovery. But standing at her bedside, he spoke only words of Christian comfort. As soon as he left her side, the sisters besieged him with questions to wrest from his lips a single word, a mere hint to ease their fears. But with gentle kindness, Don Bosco simply replied, my daughters, your mother's heavenly crown is ready. His reply was understandably sad and joyful for the sisters. It was sad because it held no hope of longer life for their foundress, but it was also joyful because it spoke of the crown awaiting her in the kingdom of heaven. With a prayer on her lips, she breathed her last on June 11, 1882, and was canonized on March 11, 1984. Now she lies incorrupt. No, the miracle of recovery I was referring to wasn't performed for her because it was God's time to pluck this sunflower for his heavenly garden. In fact, the miracle Don Bosco performed for her order wasn't even in St. John Bosco's lifetime, nor was it in Rome either. What happened in Portugal on December 8, 1888, isn't merely a miracle, but a very great miracle, as indeed Cardinal Aloysius Masella, the prefect of the Congregation of Rites, qualified a year and a half later. Sister Mary Josephine Alves de Castro, a sister of St. Dorothy, who lived in the school of Cavala in the Diocese of Guarda, became seriously sick in March. The diagnosis indicated tuberculosis. From September on, the patient grew so weak that she was no longer able even to sit up in bed. Her extraordinary confessor, Father Nicolas Rodriguez, a Jesuit who saw her several times, wrote saying that she looked just like a corpse. One day, he brought her a relic of Don Bosco. On merely kissing it, the patient felt that her heart had opened up to hope, and she experienced an inner peace. She began a novena to Mary Immaculate on November 22nd, asking through the intercession of Don Bosco that she obtain her recovery. During the night, on the fifth day of the novena, she finally fell asleep, something she had not done for a long time. During her sleep, she felt someone tap her on the shoulder and call her by name. She woke up startled, not knowing what was happening. She fainted. She was unable to say later whether her passing out lasted for a long time or not, but she did recall having seen Don Bosco, who said, I would like to do what you're asking for, but I cannot do so because Our Lady is angry with you. Nevertheless, do not lose heart. I will help you. 
So saying, he disappeared. To understand the reason for this gentle reprimand, we have to think back to a confession made by the nun prior to her sickness. I felt that I was living a life of great tepidity, she writes, for I frequently committed faults, remarkable for a religious. On April 11th, I went to confession, but to my amazement, I found that my confessor acted with great roughness toward me, and this discouraged me considerably. During the night after the apparition, she was awake. She lost her strength and fainted again. Then the Immaculate Virgin herself appeared, together with Don Bosco, who was kneeling in front of Our Lady, begging her to forgive the sister, adding that, after this, she would steadfastly keep her good resolutions. Then the Virgin said to the sister, I will not abandon you if you will mend your ways. It only lasted for a brief moment, but when it was over, the sister's soul was flooded with joy. She began the novena for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on the 29th with unparalleled fervor. On the fourth and fifth day of the novena, she was visited again by the Holy Virgin and by Don Bosco. This time, Our Lady said, if you promise to serve me with greater fervor and to be more faithful to my divine son, on my feast day, you will regain the health you have lost. In the meantime, her state of health continued to cause great preoccupation. For three consecutive days, the blood spitting that bothered her before became more frequent and threatening. She began to spit up much blood. Despite the aggravation of her sickness, the patient was waiting trustingly for the dawn of December 8th. The vigil brought her a violent fever. From three to four o'clock in the morning of the 8th, she felt she would spit out all her lungs. Then she quieted down and slept for a while. At last, she heard the well-known voice of Don Bosco, who woke her up and told her these comforting words, get up, you're healed. Don't forget what you promised. The sister leapt out of bed and lay prostrate on the floor for a few moments, aware that there was nothing more the matter with her. Nevertheless, she went back to bed again to await the community's rising bell. At five o'clock, she dressed neatly and went down to the chapel and attended two masses on her knees. Then she went with her dumbfounded sisters into the dining room where she ate with a hearty appetite. Sister Mary Josephine was 29 years of age and had been in religion nearly 10 years. When the Jesuit priest was told about it, he decided to personally study what had happened and found her to be in excellent health, busy at her duties. He wrote that he saw her once again eight years later and still found her active and blooming in health. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you'd like to see a playlist with all of Don Bosco's miracles, just click on the link above me here. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.